Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive function. This podcast is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. So join us as we explore executive function and the science of learning. And now, here's your host, the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath. Welcome to another episode of Full Prefrontal. My mission is to help people understand that their brain's prefrontal cortex, at its best, acts as an orchestra conductor, directing actions, guiding emotions, tweaking responses, and calibrating decisions in order to create a beautiful, harmonious symphony of well-lived life. And the glue that holds it all together is your social skills, your ability to form relationships, your ability to reciprocate, your ability to understand the minds of others, and your ability to resolve conflicts. But some of us are more gifted in that area than the others. And it's it's really important that we engage in conversations so that we can uncover the key components that drive and propel the prefrontal cortex to regulate itself and lead to better and more meaningful relationships. And that's why uh, you are always waiting for uh, eagerly for my guests. And today we have a special treat <laughs> because we have one of my favorites, uh, which is Professor Tony Atwood, who is a clinical psychologist who has explored autism for nearly 50 years, which is kind of, a, I'm, I'm fooled by that, by his looks, because he could not have been working in the field for 50 years when he looks, he's barely 50. So that's another note. Tony uh, wrote Asperger's Syndrome, A Guide for Parents and Professionals, which has been translated into 27 languages. And that's been my um, North Star uh, dealing with Asperger's. So I really sincerely thank him. And he is a practicing clinician with a clinic for ASD, which is Asperger's Syndrome Disorder uh, in Brisbane, Australia, and has contributed to over 30 research articles and written over 10 books on this topic. Uh, Welcome to the show, uh, Tony, how are you? Thank you, Sushita, and thank you for that introduction. You have now set me up that the audience is anticipating this fantastic presentation. I'll see what I can do. And they will never be disappointed because I personally have gained from your your humor, your talent, your wit, and your sharp observation of human potential. So thank you. Okay. So I'm gonna start with this question, which I often ask my audiences. Um, since you specialize in Asperger's social mm-hmm. skills and this ability to understand minds of others, and you're a hardcore neuropsychologist, mm-hmm. How would you describe your own uh, skills in those areas when you were a child? Uh, did, were you really great with it? Did you struggle with it? What brought you closer to this field? Um, when it comes to social skills, I was very good at it. And it was when I met autistic children who aren't that I realized how complicated it is. I and mean, in terms of social skills, uh, I never knew my parents together. I was a baby when they separated. And when I was six years old, my mother remarried an engineer. Today were diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. I see. But in that setting, I didn't feel welcome at home. So my escape was the homes of friends. And friendship was very important for me as an opportunity to be true to my real self and engage in reciprocity and facial expressions and humor and so on in friendship, which was my, should we say, coping mechanisms. But it also meant from the age of six with my stepfather, I observed him and felt you're different. You you really don't understand. And so when you say I began in this area officially 50 years ago, actually so over 60 years, because my stepfather enabled me to understand Asperger. So I'm bilingual. I love that. An early age. And so that's why when I met those autistic children, it wasn't so strange to me because I've been brought up in an Aspie household. You know, you say this, this reminds me of my personal journey. When I was a, a young child and a young person, uh, many uh, outsiders, our outliers who are socially unacceptable, unaccepted or unacceptable, always drew to me. And I maybe I don't know, maybe my um, 
I wouldn't paint in the grand ways, but I was much more patient, tolerant, and inviting. Uh, and I was raised with great um, social skills and etiquette to always be inclusive. But it annoyed me inside because these unpopular people would bring down my social capital. <laughs> <laughs> because they would always be odd and they would blurt out things that were not kosher or they would not have the veil uh, or, or pretense that gives you social creed, you know, creed. So anyway, uh, but I am so grateful for, for the upbringing I had because that really tuned me into a lot of people who had social skills problem. I had an uncle, my, my mother's sister's husband, who would classically be diagnosed as Asperger's <laughs> and he yeah. collected uh, clocks. So anyway, we can, we're going to talk more about that, but I really appreciate that. So sounds like, um, can you help define for our audience, what is Asperger's syndrome? And since DSM-5, for those who may not know, but it's a mm -hmm. psychological, um, I guess, um, categorizational or evaluative process, which has gotten rid of the term and it has embedded back into autism spectrum disorder. <laughs> So okay. There, there are the official. Okay. The, the official DSM-5 diagnostic criteria have some very good points, but I have my own, not definition, description. And when I'm doing a diagnosis, I call it a discovery rather than that. a diagnosis. And I say it's a different way of perceiving, thinking, learning, and relating. It, you found something more interesting in life than socializing. It's a different form of perception. You notice detail, sounds, patterns, systems far more effectively than others. So it's a different form of perception. It's a different form of thinking. Often it's not an internal conversation, it's visualization. It's finding solutions, not understanding why, but inspirational. It's a different way of thinking. Now, unfortunately, it's a different way of learning. Most school education is in a social conversational context. That's not the autistic way. And so it's a different way of learning. And when you accommodate their cognitive profile, then you will find abilities that are really quite entrancing. But it's also a different way of relating in terms of how the person perceives social cues, social regulation, uh, reads facial expressions and social context and is able to engage socially. And some are very competent socially, but it's exhausting because it's an intellectual process and then Delivering. frontal lobe comes in because it's processing time, etc. cetera. Um, and so there can be success, but it is unfortunately at the cost of exhaustion. Now, DSM-5. DSM-5 is... It, on the whole, I'm, I'm, I do think it has many positive aspects, but I do think that it is most unfortunate that the United States, in terms of its psychologists, psychiatrists and professionals, have a perception of autism that Leo Kanner produced in terms of the silent, aloof autistic child. And have, we have yet to have someone other than Fred Volkman in the United States who champions the far end of the spectrum. I call it, it's like visual impairment. There are those who are blind. Oh, very obvious. But there are those like me. I am visually impaired, but I'm not blind. Mm. And I see the social dimension of autism like visual impairment. And we need to accept and support those who in the terms of the social development can do reasonably well to a certain point. And DSM-5 in section, um, to a certain extent, the section that refers to camouflaging and compensating, I think DSM-5 is right in that. But the American view is one of a disability, mm. primarily for financial reasons. And DSM-5 is for money. It's basically so that the person can be given uh, insurance company funding. It is sufficiently severe to warrant that. We've got to go beyond the finance and look at the individual and realize this person has major social needs and we need to accommodate that and approach it from the autism perception. So this is a problem we have with girls and women. 
the United States does not have a champion for the girls and women, or those that I call at the upper end of the spectrum. And so in Europe, Australia and other countries, they have been in far in advance in terms of both research and therapy for such individuals compared to the USA. Sorry, but that's my perception. No, I'm so glad you, uh, uh, first of all, I think laid out the foundation and um, uh, two thoughts come to mind about uh, what you just said about uh, that inclusivity. As we widen the circle of inclusivity uh, and more important value we gain is lack of stigma. I think that is so important because it's not only comes from something lacking, but something that is strengthening you. If you have a language that you speak, I mean, to me, people with autism are multilingual. They speak visual spatial language that many people are impaired. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, the the point, though, I think the analogy that you gave with with the visual impairment with glasses or no glasses, one thing is the reason maybe there was quicker acceptability of you needing correction in spite of your visual impairment versus autism. It doesn't involve other people because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, imagine like if you bumped into people as part of your visual impairment, then you will be a bigger nuisance, not you, but your disability. Yeah. So yeah. there is that interdependence on social skills where lack of somebody's ability to socially re relate appropriately interferes uh, with others' ability to interact with them. Do you think that has to do with the way we approach autism and, and particularly Asperger's and the stigma that goes with it? Yeah, but, but can I transfer that to how yeah. other children would perceive the child? They know they're different before they have a diagnostic assessment. Yes. They have a different way of relating, talking, perception. And other kids know they're different. Now that means that the other kids sometimes see them as, I'm afraid to say this, not human. Oh, yes. And that means that you have no guilt for bullying and teasing. Yeah. And so a lot of my clinical work is actually trying to repair the damage done by neurotypicals. I don't mind autism. Autism, fine. You, know, you have that. You're different. That's all right. I see. But I am concerned about neurotypicals and how they will relate to someone who, by definition, is different. Mm. And that will bring out either compassion or cruelty. And that cruelty can lead to trauma and despair that we spend a lot of effort trying to undo what neurotypicals did. It's not the autism. It's often the result of neurotypicals. And you know, I, I really, my heart aches as I hear you speak about this, that there are two paths. Uh, one is cruelty or compassion. And what is, what is up with us as neurotypicals? Why is there such a compulsion to, to assimilate and particularly children? You know, they don't want to be different. And then anybody who's different, who is uh, dehumanizing that. Uh, I will tell you a quick story. I had a second grader, um, um, a mom was giving her bath and she noticed that she had long, long red streaks on her back. Not one or two, there were like seven long streaks. Mm -hmm. It looked like somebody had crawled their nails on her back. Mom was panicked and she called the teacher that night immediately the next day she showed up at school, the, everybody gathered and they said, no, nobody has touched her. Nobody has interacted with her. And so they tracked everything, what had happened. So the, they said, the only time we have seen her do is this, this was before even she got the diagnosis. Mm. She does something very unique. They said, not weird, but they mm. said, she sits in the corner of the playground gathering pine cones. And um, so we wonder, and so once they started talking and I um, got involved, it turned out this girl did not know how to engage these kids. So she would invent these games and the, she had of course trouble, but she, she would invent, invite them to slide the pine cones back her back. Mm -hmm. So the kids did it a couple of times. They thought it was weird, but funny, you know, not fun. Yeah. And she got their engagement. And, and of course that was the way, the reason she got the back, uh, the streaks on her back. The challenge there is, Everybody went to protect her, but she didn't understand anything like why this is not a good way to engage. But also the other kids did not, not do that. You see what I mean? 
they readily engaged with that. And that's pretty heartaching. These were normal kids. These were decent kids. These were not harmful or, or weird or, or bullies. They were just went along. Yeah. I, I think when we, uh, just expanding on this a little bit further, um, you asked the, the original question was about my own childhood. I strongly suspect that on my father's side, there are signs of, of autism. And I think there are those who are neurotypical, are born with the neural structures genetically to understand autism. Mm. And I think you'll find that there are some people who understand autism, they never had any training. They just get it. And when you ask, oh, he's just like my dad. Oh, he's just like my uncle. My granddad yes. was like that. Yes. Or my grandma was like that. And then I think it's not just observation of that person. I think the neural structures are there genetically to get it very easily, but they're a minority. I see, yeah. I see. Oh, wow. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, what are the symptoms of somebody? How do you diagnose them? And uh, what are the typical concerns or what age group parents become very concerned? Okay, I think there, there are certain essential components and DSM-5 is, is absolutely correct in the term reciprocity. It's the balance. And it can either be the aloof autistic person who really is on the periphery, doesn't want to engage, lack of eye contact, is being alone, not lonely. But I also know of the extrovert as opposed to introvert. Now the extrovert wants to socialize, wants to engage, a little bit like that girl that you were just describing. And the extrovert splits into two groups. One I call Italian drivers. They don't read the signals. Now, your face, as you smiled, it's like traffic lights. Green light, keep talking. If you, your eyebrows went down and you looked a bit puzzled with your head to one side, amber light, slow down and explain. If you burst into tears, red light, I'd stop. So they don't see the no tailgating signs, the <laughs> men at work signs and keep interrupting you. And they break the codes and they can't understand what did I do wrong? but they have a lack of theory of mind, that is the ability to perceive nonverbal communication. But over the last five to 10 years, we found that there's another group of extroverts that pull back, observe, analyze, and imitate. In autism, you're very good at looking at systems and patterns, especially pattern breaks, but patterns. And if you're not good at social, you say, okay, I'm going to watch. I'm going to look for patterns. What are the social rules? And when I get them, I will be the rule policeman. And I'll become very upset if somebody breaks the rules and it's not fair. So this is an individual who observes the patterns, analyzes the interplay. It's a complex intellectual process and then creates a mask. Mm to camouflage and compensate in various ways for their social confusion. It's a script. And what I say is, and this was from a friend and colleague, Maya again, who said the person should be awarded an Oscar every day for their performance as neurotypical. Wow. And so what I've got to look at is in the diagnostic assessment, the degree of withdrawal. Do they read the signals? Do they give me the signals? What you've got to do is create an opportunity of reciprocity and engagement, okay? And you just check what's going on. You try and do this as naturally as possible. But then there are those that, for example, have in ADOS, it's an absence of social gestures, but you have the girl who goes, um, and I don't know. And then I don't know. And then I don't know. And it's stylized. Hmm. It is an imitation. It's the right gesture but it's a borrowed gesture. Mm. So what you have is a realization that this person has learned the script. The act. Sometimes I will notice they are duplicating my facial expressions and gestures. So it's a qualitative analysis that needs to be explored. And this is the subtleties in an ADOS may not pick up the subtleties of what's occurring. So it is a degree of engagement. It's also other areas, for example, 
some of the things I picked up is with adults, I'll say, I don't really know you. Um, tell me, very simple question, but I'd like to know your answer. Who are you? And neurotypicals will answer very quickly and define the self by their social network or a complex vocabulary of personality types. Mm. Here, the person defines the self by what they do and know. Oh, wow. Or yes. they can't answer that. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, um, do you know the show called Boston Legal? Um, I've heard of it, yes. Oh, that's... So this is my theory. So I came from India and I'm not very well versed with American television. And I saw, um, I've been here now for 25 years. And one of the things I saw a transformation before my time, there was a show called Mork and Mindy. And mm -hmm. all the odd behaviors of Robin Williams were because he was an alien. Yes. Then there came a show um, that was actually called Third Rock from the Sun. Oh, yes, I know. Yes. And, and so the whole family was an alien family trying to assimilate. So they were not like Mork and Mindy. He was like little alien. They were alien uh, in the body of assimilated humans doing running into faux pas. Then fast forward, you have shows like, uh, you know, Sheldon, Big, the Big Bang Theory, and then the surgeon or mm. where actually full blown uh, people with spectrum disorder are actually uh, depicted, but they are now dominating the scene. They're saying, we won't change our behaviors and all the adjustment is done by others. So I see a cultural transformation as I look at the way we have begun to understand before we made fun of them, now we laugh with them. And now as we, uh, time progresses, there's even more revering them for their unique qualities. Yes. Can I take that up? Because what is occurring is respect. And when I talk to the kids, one of the things they lack at school is respect. Yes. They talk about it yearning for acceptance and respect. And they're dealing with a group that in fact are very intolerant of anyone who's different, but respect is important. Society is changing that, but there is a, a problem that's occurring in high schools. And today, if a student makes a social error, the derogatory comment is, huh, what's the matter with you? Are you autistic or something? Oh, wow. And so the term autistic has become a derogatory term for anyone who doesn't read the social cues. So That's you've got good. to be very careful that, of a distraction. That's one of the reasons why many teenagers reject the diagnosis, not because they don't agree with it, but they know what their peer group will think when that's confirmed. It's viewed as someone, again, in a, a derogatory way. And you know, to your point, uh, I do see they, there's a greater recognition of their unique qualities and contribution mm. to society. For example, like you said, engineers uh, or talented um, IT professionals, but they, to me, there is a, some attitude of using them. Uh, using their talents and discarding their place in social interactions. I'm circling back and finishing my thought about Boston Legal. I was taken aback. This this show is, I think, 2010 or maybe seven, something like that. But they actually had a lawyer who had, uh, who was, uh, I mean, he, he was an as a person with Asperger's and had all the quirks and almost placed in the plot uh, as a humor, humor, source of humor. So I cringed because that was laughing because of his idiosyncrasies, but not really having compassion for his suffering. And oh, yes. I just didn't like that at all. Okay. What I've done is I've actually talked to TV producers. Have you? And I say that this person clearly has autism. And they said, oh, we can't say that because then people wouldn't laugh. Yes, you can't laugh at disability. So we can't say they have autism. Oh my goodness. But then we have a problem there because then they we, we are also saying that all the oopsies and, and faux pas are only worth laughing at or yes. and, finding and all they want at. is the audience to laugh. And that's their goal as scriptwriters and producers. 
is to make the audience laugh. But we can't say that they're autistic because what well, people would say, no, that's not fair. Now, can I take you back on something you, want, you said a moment ago? And careers in IT. Yes, you're absolutely right. But that's only a third. Because <laughs> when I look at the careers, there are those with autism who have alexithymia. We've only been exploring this in autism in the last five or 10 years. Although it was originally known in the 1970s as a part of psychoanalysis, whereby the person has difficulty converting thought and emotion to speech. So when you ask them, what are you feeling now? I don't know, come on, what are you feeling? You can tell me every dinosaur in the Jurassic period. What are you feeling? I don't know. I will now complete the sentence. I don't know how to grasp one of the many thoughts and feelings swirling in my mind, hold it, identify it and explain it in speech so that you will understand. So the conversion of thought and emotion into speech is impaired. However, if you ask that teenager, can you create me a playlist of music that describes your feelings? Can you go to Google images, type in what you think is the feeling and choose 10 images that represent that. You are a great fan of Harry Potter. Choose me a part of a movie or a paragraph in a Harry Potter book that perfectly describes your inner thoughts and feelings. Play me some music on the piano. And this is where many with autism, with their difficulty converting thought and emotion into speech are in the arts, fine art, music. They mm. sing in perfect pitch. They become conductors spotting the errors of the orchestra. They have an attention to detail, perception and color in the arts, Vincent van Gogh and Andy Warhol, that we need to recognize that the arts is a career. The third is the person has observed and analyzed people and became a psychologist at three years old and they graduate with a PhD in psychology in their 20s. And they become very effective clinical psychologists and psychiatrists. Mm, I know so many of them. And I thought yes. you also mentioned the whole field of medicine, because again, it's a content heavy, very yes. structured. Uh, do you see that as well? Yeah, the research has I, shown, my clinical experience confirms that the career with the highest level of autistic kids is medicine. Wow. And so I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that's another, uh, you, you pointed out my stereotyping uh, only focusing on technology and information mm. processing. Um, so tell us a little bit about, I had this question about their, um, their social emotional makeup. So you have said that people with Asperger's syndrome may lead an emotionally reclusive life. And in your book, you talk about uh, one example of Lilian, Liliana, I think, uh, one of the adult patients who eagerly explained, I don't have emotional skin to or yes. protection. We are exposed and that is why we hide. I love that you captured that in your book. What does okay. that mean? Okay. Um, first of all, when you do formal testing of the ability to read facial expressions, body language, and so on, what we call theory of mind, and you show that person with autism a facial expression, what's this person feeling? They go, either I don't know, or five seconds later, they cognitively worked it out by a process of elimination and checking back with previous images in their mind. It's a retrieval process. They can actually get it. And so often in a formal setting, the person has difficulty reading uh, nonverbal communication. The other problem is it is so fast. Processing time, executive functioning, means that they are often missing it and out of sync. So that can be one of the problems that occur. However, in the autobiographies and in the conversations, especially with women on the spectrum, they describe a sixth sense perception of emotion in others. And I will talk to somebody and they'll say, <clears throat> I'm feeling sad today, really sad. I said, oh, what's happened to make you sad? What event has occurred? Uh, nothing. Oh, I, I had a chat with Rebecca. Rebecca's feeling sad. 
she infected me with her sadness. Yeah. And this is why the, sometimes the child becomes very upset if the teacher in correcting them is irritated, disappointed, even to a minor degree, the child finds that very aversive. And so sometimes social withdrawal is not purely because of social immaturity and confusion. It's a protection mechanism mm. from emotionality in others. And when I ask, where did this come from? They say, I don't know, but I can just sense negativity and I'm infected by it. Now, if you go to this further in autism, unfortunately, they're not easily infected by happiness and euphoria. They'll be very quickly infected by disappointment, irritation, anxiety, anger, for example, and they're very uh, reactive to it and amplify it. But if you try to jolly them up or use affection and those sorts of things, no, it doesn't, uh, it's like a filter system or a, uh, should we say a plumbing system. The valve will only allow through negative emotions, but mm. not positive. You know, and it's really disheartening. I, I have an adult uh, person, um, an adult I work with and she, um, she, it, she's very sensitive to changes in mood of others. And one of the filters she has developed is, what did I do to make you feel this way? So her immediate self-blame comes in. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are doing like just the CBT approach, but doing a lot of perspective taking. Is it possible for others to have certain experiences that is influencing their emotions and they're not in relationship to you. And it takes a lot of cognitive effort, as you know, to go walk yourself through that. It's not me, it's you. It's not me, it's you. It uh, is. And, right? But, okay, but you, you've also identified there another autistic characteristic of self-blame. And when I explore this further, this doesn't come from parents. This doesn't come from teachers or peers. It's self-imposed. And that mm. self-blame, that self doubt it's a fear of being judged, actually, in general. Um, they don't like people judging them. But also the, the component is their tendency to be self-critical, to personalize Very. in their cognitive, should we say, thinking distortion, is what did I do wrong in that situation without realizing the perception of others, their motivations. And if you can't understand the motives of others, your first reaction is going to be, what did I do wrong? Because I can understand that, but I can't understand your motives. And it's that difficulty of understanding the motives can lead to cognitive, I suppose, to a certain extent, it is ruminating mm. on why people would tease me, why people would do that. And because you can't find an answer you can't have closure and that causes a lot of problems. Yeah, and this reminds me of uh, Hannah Gatsby, the comedian from Australia who came on the stage, broke on the stage with great, it was so well received that the next show she did, she came out as having autism spectrum. And uh, I have heard now a lot of her interviews uh, which she, she talks about not knowing there was anything wrong with her in a, in a way, but never always getting excluded. And that she wasn't even aware that she was being excluded. Her lack of awareness kind of acted as a protection until she became a teenager. And then it, the social world opened up a little bit only to realize you're not part of it. And um, yeah. right. Okay, can I take you a pause on that? Yes, please. Because as, as a clinician, this is why the girls are often not diagnosed until the teenage years when the wall, wheels fall off. Yes. When there's a degree of insight and complexity of what's going on. Because if you're imitating and it's relatively simple, you can create this facade of inclusion and success superficially and somebody externally observing. But it's in the teenage years when it becomes far more subtle and internal. That's when the person starts to realize it's not working. And that's when they can go off the rails in terms of personality disorders, 
eating disorders, a whole range of things. And so they're first diagnosed with borderline personality disorder or anorexia nervosa or gender dysphoria, not as a diagnosis, but as a description. And that means that when a developmental history is taken for the first time, the pattern of autism is identified. But for many of the girls and women, it is in the teenage years when they either, uh, they become either what I call a goody two shoes, puritanical nun, and they do everything. And the teacher thinks they're wonderful, but you wait till they get home and they've suppressed it because in autism, you, you either suppress it or you're avoiding it. OK, you don't cognitively process it, but at home, you're a different character or they go to the dark side. And in teenage life, for those with autism, it's needing connection. They're seeking connection. And the thing is, they may get connection in a group that is tolerant of a width of diversity, but may not be encouraging, like anorexia nervosa and so on. Strategies for coping, which we would recommend. You know, the, uh, Hannah Gatsby's interview, she says that I would struggle all day, uh, I would keep it bottled up, then I would uh, come home and I would have a massive meltdown. And then my parents would turn around and say, she's just being hormonal, she's just a teenager. And she never received any diagnosis until, you know, later in life, because all her oddities were either chalked off as, oh, that's just Hannah, or uh, get over it. Like you're not trying yes. to get over it. <laughs> yeah, it um, is. And, and to a certain extent, it, it's not necessarily severe enough to bring in expertise. And the general public wouldn't necessarily know because the general publics have a view of the male description. But one of the interesting things we're finding is that some males will do the same of observe, analyze and imitate. And so they're also now being identified. We've picked it up with the girls first because they tend to write the autobiographies. Boys tend, men don't tend to write autobiographies unless they're famous. And so we're now finding that this process occurs with the males as well. And that means that the true level of autism spectrum disorder Could be much is much higher. And what the Centers for Disease Control does is assess the number of eight-year-olds in a particular geographic area. That's great, that's lovely. But you're missing the girls because they won't be picked up till they're 13, 14. So it's still a conservative estimate. Wow. So could you speak to this contradiction in people with Asperger's syndrome, uh, what they lack in their interpersonal relationships or social reciprocity is made up by their remarkable ability in a chosen area of expertise or interest maybe, and uh, often called in our field like special interest. Uh, uh, what I see is that they tend to know a lot of facts and details about certain topics. They seem to be uh, collecting objects. Uh, they have very, very, very hyper-focused interest. Um, and what they bring to the conversation is conversation about the stuff it, and not of people. Okay, and this is where I find round right about from age nine onwards, you tend to get autistic friendships with those who share the same interests. Now, obviously it's um, Minecraft and a, a whole range of things too. Um, but what the person will do is search for someone who shares the same interest. And that's one of our common grounds for friendships, it may be Lego. It could be a whole range of things that are of, of similar interest. It's comic con and cosplay. Mm. It's, it's the Harry Potter group or the Star Wars Appreciation Society, Star <laughs> Trek conventions, etc. And so you will find someone and the basis of friendship is similar experiences. And so sometimes the greatest friendships but also the greatest wisdom comes not from professionals. It comes from those on the spectrum themselves. So when I'm running groups and somebody presents a problem to the group, I can maybe come in with a suggestion, my colleague Michelle may, but if the suggestion comes from somebody else on the spectrum, 
it has far more credibility yes because they've experienced it and so what i'm trying to do is put those with autism in touch with those with autism so that that they can share that experience and that that's what i did with uh craig evans and anita lesko in the book been there done that try this (laughs) where we did a survey 300 people what are your biggest challenges the greatest challenge was anxiety right we got various people Uh, Stephen Shaw, Temple Grandin and others to write a brief essay on as mature people on the spectrum what they would recommend for the younger ones that worked for them and that becomes a treasure trove of information which has the credibility and the description which is heartbreaking at times but then those with autism say ah I will try that because somebody who's experienced it found it worked. You know, I had uh, Elizabeth uh, Lagerson. Uh, she is the clinical psychologist from UCLA, who uh, uh, is the director of the PEERS program um, mm-hmm. that does parent-assisted social skills training. And one of the things we were talking about is um, this challenge with uh, people with um, autism and or on the spectrum who fall on the darker side of uh, social disconnection. Can you comment a little bit about uh, the the, um, percentage of children or or young young adolescents who join Mm -hmm. white supremacy groups or those who engage in bullying in virtual space? Uh, Many of them struggle with, uh, with the spectrum disorder uh, and and not understanding the full ramification of other impact of their behaviors, particularly n- lack of face-to-face interactions, uh, but really not seeing or whatever treatment they have received, they tend to respond to that in a uh, way that may be not so savory, but also not understanding the impact. Um, what is your experience in that? Okay, several things there. Many of the teenagers are seeking connection. They're not necessarily being accepted and connecting with the conventional teenagers, young adults. Um, But what they're looking for uh, is acceptance. But a characteristic of autism can be black and white thinking, no gray areas. And when you get to fundamentalist religions and political groups, it's black and white. It is a very clear what's allowed and not allowed. And that rigidity, that yes. sense of certainty of following a script, the Bible, the Quran, gives you no need to, to think and make a philosophical, moral interpretation. It's there in black and white. It's usually in Christian terms. It's an Old Testament God of retribution, not a New Testament Jesus Christ compassion Mm. and so that person is then um, intoxicated by feeling this is my home this is my new family this is a group of people that are encouraging me in my beliefs and so the risk can be that they start to become manipulable by those who will see them as we use in britain the term cannon fodder for the cause Mm. And that can be a problem. So do we have data to know how many people who join cults or extremist activism, or it's not even called activism, I guess, uh, what percentage of that population tends to be? On we have no idea. It is very difficult to go up to these organizations. Excuse me. Can I want to administer to every person in your group the autism quotient? Because I want to know how many are autistic. They're not going to do that. <laughs> Tony, if anybody can be persuaded, it will be you <laughs> persuading them. I, I would have to persuade it in a way that it's to their advantage. But it does mean it's a problem um, for parents who can feel that they're starting to lose their son or daughter. Uh, another component that will occur in the teenage years is the teenager will discover the cure to autism. And there is a cure. There is a way of dissolving all the diagnostic criteria in DSM-4 and DSM-5. It's very easy. 
you go into your bedroom and close the door and you're cured because you can't have a deficit in social emotional reciprocity in reading nonverbal communication and maintaining friendships and relationships or section a of dsm5 go section b you can flap you can rock you can live in an environment where there are no sensory intrusions, you are able to engage in your special interest and nobody tells you to stop it, and your routines and rituals are to cope with anxiety, you're not anxious anymore, you're cured. And so for many teenagers, they become a recluse Mm. in their bedroom on the computer. They may change day-night cycle, and they say to mum and dad, what's the problem? I don't cost you much. All I do is at midnight, raid the fridge, go back to my room, lock it. And I'll put all my laundry once a month outside (laughs) the door and just put it in a pile when it's done. And so they found the cure because you're not going to be bullied. You're not going to be teased. You don't have to stress yourself by social emotional situations. So they found the cure. The cure of autism is solitude. Mm. Now, especially solitude in your bedroom or nature. And you have behind you an autism friendly environment. It's nature. I it's natural that. sounds. It slows accelerating thoughts. It's a sense of peace and tranquility you can't get in social urban life. Yes. You know, and plus also, I think there's stability in nature where it takes a long time for change to happen. So mm. if, if, I mean, unless you have like a rain when it was sunny, that not that kind of thing. But the landscape, you know, there is a, some anchoring effect there when you have mountain that doesn't go away. <laughs> you have trees yes. that always give shade. That's like some sense of reliability you have. And you don't have to interpret what they're doing with you. No. No. And you don't have surprises. <laughs> no surprises. Yes. yes. So it, you can understand that it, if I am looking at the sense of well-being, of an autistic person. It's encouraging time in nature as much as we can, because that that is the restorative, it is the natural environment of someone on the spectrum, is to be in nature, with animals in particular, because animals accept you, animals are kind. You get animals, they get you. And they love you, (laughs) no matter whether you have great eye contact or not. (laughs) No, no, they just adore you. So as long as you feed them, Um, it means that what we're having to do is look at not behavior modification, but environmental modification, because many of the autistic behaviors are coping mechanisms for stress Mm. because of the intense social environment they are in. You have a different person in a different environment. So, um, so you all already touched upon this, but does um, does treatment a, um, can is treatment the right word when we talk about uh, is there is the word intervention a, a better word or is the when like you said environmental modification but empowering uh, individuals to recognize the nature and scope of their diagnosis and understanding what is um, Uh, you can, you know, the kind of people like dealing with acceptance, I do a lot of self-advocacy work uh, and and teaching how to understand you, you can stay different. You don't need to learn all the social skills because you, it will only take you to a point where you're imitating, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. or there's always going to be a place where you are going to be like, oh my God, I, this is way beyond my pay grade. So what will be, uh, how do you structure intervention? uh, And what's the role of CBT? You, you said one of the key words, acceptance. Be a first-rate Aspie, not a second-rate neurotypical. Oh, I love that. Okay, yes. it is accept who you are, but explain. Don't change, explain. I'm the sort of person who, I'm the sort of person who tends to look away when you're talking, helps me concentrate on what you're saying. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm the sort of person who loves talking about Russian T-34 tanks. Unfortunately, this is boring for other people. If I'm boring you, I'm not good at reading the signals. Let me know and I'll stop. I'm not good at reading the signals. So rather than teach, it's explain. And then the neurotypical goes, ah, I've noticed that. Now I know why 
I understand and accept. So if I'm looking at, at treatment, I am also working on acting. When in Rome, do as Romans do. So when you are at work or in various situations, this is your role, this is your script. It's the artificial you when the curtain opens and you're on stage, this is what you do. However, when the curtain closes and you go home, be true to yourself. But to get the job you want, you've got to learn the niceties, the script and so on. If I do look at treatment, yes, absolutely, but it's not for autism. It's for anxiety, depression, and emotion management. Yes. And that's not in the diagnostic criteria, but there is treatment, but it's because of problems expressing and managing and regulating emotions. I love that. I had uh, your colleague from Australia, Dr. Ron Rapay, uh, mm -hmm. who studies anxiety or provides interventions. And, and I think that that was the same point. I think um, what he was saying too, that anxiety may be a response to the amount of stress you're feeling. It may not be the original diagnosis, but any treatment you're providing is the tool set to manage it. So last question I have about, um, and then don't forget social skill development where <laughs> understanding. <laughs> hey, look at the time. No, no, no. I mean, I am a speech pathologist, so we do pragmatic interventions, which is actually yes. understanding the, the setting and, and the protocol of each setting and understanding uh, needs of others and expressing or checking in with others and providing them uh, that emotional um, support in the best capacity you can so that they also knowing that they have goals, desires, mm -hmm. needs, and emotional requirements. So, um, so the last question I had was about being duped. Um, one of the and and one of the challenges with somebody with Asperger's is this inability to understand intent correctly, and being taken advantage of. They become very susceptible to scams and uh, emotional manipulations or exploitation at workplace. Never giving them promotions, um, keeping them longer than uh, lo longer hours. Never really because they don't understand the nuances or the politics. Um, is this something you work with or experience? Uh, what are your suggestions for uh, tackling those challenges? Okay, you've, you've gone through one dimension of that, which is the naivety, gullibility, generosity and kindness and taking people by what they say, not what they mean and assume everyone is as kind as they are, which means that employers may take advantage of them and so on. However, I want to go to a darker side, particularly for the teenage girls and young women and yes. the sexual predators. Yes. And they don't read the intentions. They don't have a group of friends to go out with for protection. They don't have a group of friends to say, I wouldn't trust this guy. Hmm. In their naivety and Shall we say euphoria? Yep, I'll go to the bar. Yep, oh, I've never had vodka before, etc. And they are intoxicated by the intention, attention, but not aware that the intentions are not honourable. And so there are a couple of books, one by, um, well, Debbie Brown wrote one and uh, Leanne Holiday willie wrote another because of their own experiences. They don't want others with autism to experience that. So what Leanne does is, or did, was that if somebody new comes into their circle of contacts, she has a group of friends who are very good at character judgments. And she ensures that they see them and indirectly assess them. And if they say, Leanne, you're not very good at this, are you? She says, okay, okay, that's it, no more. Or if they say, no, Leanne, I think that's okay, but slowly, carefully, because it, it, there can be an intensity. In, in autism, there's a problem of intensity. Yeah. And uh, the, of taking it too fast and being too excited and intoxicated by the situation. So I do have to explain to parents and teenage girls and young women. With the young women, when I talk to them, there are frequent descriptions of date rape. There's abuse, that is, uh, financial, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse that occurs. There's low self-esteem. I'm not worth anything more than this. And they tend sometimes to be attracted to lame dogs uh, who are not good in potential 
relationship qualities. And so sometimes that can be a problem of, it's like either a moth to a flame and they shouldn't go there or the predators will spot their naivety, insecurity, lack of support network and to be taken advantage of. Again, the problem is neurotypicals, not autistic people. Yeah, and, and I think that's the sad part that, uh, you know, the bystander effect, you need society to be looking out uh, mm -hmm. for those who appear, a, a drunk girl who came alone or is now going with a guy when she's actually not even walking, he's mm -hmm. holding her up. That should be an alarming, but I think we have become very, I, I don't know, um, I, I don't want to call it, it indifferent, it, but people are just so cautious about what their role is. You know what I mean? It is, this, this is a function, I think, of high density populations. If you live in a village, people will step in. Hmm. Yeah. But people cope with high density living by creating a bubble or barrier. It's their only way of coping. So if they're on uh, the metro or a bus, they won't look at each other because it's too crowded. Yes. But if you've got a bus, in a village community, oh, they're all chatting, ah, yeah, yeah, and, and they are socially engaged, but responsible for each other. I love that. Whereas, so, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Whereas? I can tell you, the loneliest place can be where the most number of people are. Um, I'll, I'll end with one quick story. I had a client once uh, who um, had a lot of difficulty um, understanding. She was about 19, and so one, she at 2 a.m., a guy called her, a guy who was an acquaintance, not even a boyfriend or any such thing, and asked her, would you uh, come and visit me? I'm feeling lonely. And she said, he was lonely, you know? And so she went, and of course, it was a booty call, as, as we call it in America. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very delicate situation because it was clear example of exploitation, but um, myself and the therapist, we were working together with her parents. It was very... Um, delicate situation because if you tell her she just got used, that would have devastating effect. But then how do you, um, you know, um, we, we had to really craft as a collective strategy about how to create those uh, confidants by whom you run these decisions. Okay. And this is some of the, the new work that I'm doing again with my friend and colleague, Michelle Garnett, is building resilience, a concept of self. Love and that. so this is perhaps the fourth wave of cognitive behavior therapy is who are you? And it's building up a strength of character, your qualities in personality and abilities. And by having that self-confidence and resilience, you are less likely to follow through with the predators because they're looking for somebody who doesn't have that resilience. Mm. I love that. So you're talking about identity, that I am the person who doesn't. I am the person who does. Uh, yeah. In my family, we, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, we have some some interesting things like if you were an animal, what animal would you be? Oh, yes, I love that. And, and then we say, OK, well, some people are a snake. Some people are a wolf in sheep's clothing. OK, so that's a way of characterization. Another one we'll do is to create a collage. And in that collage are important people to you, real and fictional, your uh, favorite photos, mementos, things that are important to you. And we spend some time creating all the uh, content of this collage and then putting it all together and where they put things in the connections can be absolutely fascinating. I, I will share one last thing. Sorry, this is going on my sharing, but I do uh, um, concentric circles of connections with them, hmm. which is the same concept, uh, but these are concentric circles and who goes in the center of it which is the closest people to you and then peripheral. And then of course we have objects, interest and people uh, in yes. concentric circles. And then we have rules for each circle. So further away from the concentric circle in the center, less freedom yes. of giving them uh, of decision-making power or giving them uh, for, you know, and, and talk, we talk about coming to the stop sign. So who came first to the stop sign? So the last person who yes. came has to wait. So they don't get. So last person in the circle doesn't get your attention. So that kind of, um, we talk about that visualizing the concept it of is. relationship. I, I use that and I color code it like a rainbow. So you have red in the center and blue. So I'll say, this person is in the green circle. Now this person is in the 
orange circle. And just using that color coding can Love speak that. volumes. Yeah. Okay, so I don't color code. That's a fantastic idea. Well, Tony, I have taken up a lot of your time and we obviously can talk for hours, not just one hour. Um, oh, days, days. Yes, <gasps> yes. Well, as we close, um, I wanted to see if you had, you already have given a lot of recommendations about the expertise in this area, but do you have books that influenced you as a person or a person and as a thinker and as a learner? that you think every person should explore? Oh, it, it's a tricky one because sometimes reading can either be professionally or for pleasure. Whichever. Okay. Um, oh, good question. Where did I begin? The, Lorna Wing in the... I first became officially interested in autism in 1971 when it was childhood schizophrenia or childhood psychosis. And she wrote an excellent book, not only as a psychiatrist, but a mother of Susan. And uh, her book, which is now ancient, it's on my shelf and I haven't looked at it. But what I found was that it was so prophetic in its understanding, which was remarkable. Uh, so I think Lorna Wing and, and her, I, anything Lorna Wing did, she died a few years ago, I have with great respect. She was the one who first used the term Asperger's syndrome. Isn't she the one who actually challenged the, uh, not challenged, but came up with uh, the label as well as the a different approach to it, right? Yeah, she did. She, at the time, the view was, if you can find, if you're finding a pattern, you search, has anybody else found this before you? And she did, Hans Asperger. And so as the protocol was then, she called it Asperger's syndrome because in the 1940s, he described very accurately because that was his training, accurate description, a group of people that she said Asperger's syndrome, but she's British. And this is where I say the Americans have never really understood Asperger's because it wasn't discovered by an American. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know the whole neuro tribe history there. <laughs> oh, okay. Right. So I think that's a, a very, very important book. Is that um, the one that Beyond the Silence? I'm not sure. I, 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 I'd, I'd have to find a few moments. It's, it's in one of my far in my library, in the far corners of the library. Um, we will list it so people have in our show notes so people can actually uh, look it up. Thank you. And which other second book you were thinking about? Uh, now, no, this is going to be strange. Please um, go for strange. You're British. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. It, it's strange. <laughs> no, no, it, it's my own book. And this, this <laughs> oh no, my God, it, that's, I love it. No, which no, one? No, seriously, because I will look at it and I will go back and I think that was good. Oh, I like that phrase. And and I, I keep thinking, did I actually write this? Is this me? I thought, oh, that was really good. Oh, <laughs> that was insightful. Who wrote? It was me. Is that the so, Asperger's I, Syndrome I, Complete Guide? Because that's my favorite. That's yes. one of my favorite books. Yeah. So in a way, it's it's looking back at how my perception of autism has changed. And what I saw so many years ago, I find as a clinician, academics are about 10 to 20 years behind clinicians. Yes. And I read, I have to read, I'm a professor, I have to read journal articles. And they'll say, we've discovered this. I, I knew that 20 years ago. <laughs> but you only, dis, only accept it now because you have got data for it. There is wisdom, which is more important than data. Because in academia, data is what the more data you have the higher status i say wisdom wisdom is more important well tony you are amazing and i'm again <laughs> just i i'm moving to australia so that i can spend not moving maybe I'll one week in the pandemic so not to scare you but thank you for being with us and sharing your wisdom um again i think yes uh, you you are not wrong to uh, admire some of the writings because sometimes the the there's a lot of poetry to your writing and there's a lot of compassion and and I think as you look back you can wonder but 
you just know that every person who reads your books feels the same way. There's a sense of, wow, that is so beautifully said. Uh, And you bring a hope for us. Thank you. It, It means that as they watch this, they will now have a face and a voice to what they've read. And they will know that what they read is my voice. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, folks, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please uh, share with your friends, subscribe uh, uh, to our podcast newsletter and um, l- like or leave a comment. We are sure to read any questions you post. And thank you for staying connected and always, always sending uh, good wishes our way. Uh, once again, this is Sucheta, and I look forward to getting together again on the next podcast. Thank you, Tony. Okay, thank you, Sucheta. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive function. To contact your host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive function, visit her website at exqinfinitenowhow.com. That's www.exqinfinitenowhow.com. Tune in next week for another informative episode of Full Prefrontal, hosted by the founder of EXQ, Sucheta Kamath.